Um, my name is Tembi Sozwane. Thank you for the opportunity to share our collaborative work in this CWM conference on liberation. This presentation is a product of a series of contextual Bible studies uh, organized um, by the Uchama Center in South Africa, as well as the uh, Center for Theology and Public Issues in New Zealand. And the overview of the presentation is that we'll look at the first part of the presentation, we'll introduce the Ujamaa Center principles of contextual Bible study as a frame to the presentation on CBS on the crucifixion. The second part, which David will introduce, will present the CBS on the crucifixion, focusing on May 27, uh, verses 26 to 31. The third part, Charlie will deal with, uh, will introduce some of the uh, elements of the stripping of Jesus from the text to context. So this is our overview uh, of the presentation. Now for the first part of our presentation that we'll share, um, Albert Nolans introduced the co concept of shape uh, to the understanding of the gospel. The core values of the CPS, according to Gerard West, takes a particular liberationist shape um, that is contextual to the understanding of the gospel. So there are about five liberationist um, C's that shapes the contextual Bible study um, as a frame uh, to this presentation. The first C is community. Community-based reading of the biblical text has this liberationist shape because it begins with the realities of the poor and the marginalized. The Bible is not read individually, but communally which facilitates participatory community development. The second C is criticality. The Bible, the Bible or the biblical text is ideotheological and comes from a particular social historical background that is different to our contemporary background. Hence the need to discern its relevance through the analysis of the shape um, and it does offer the good news or the bad news depending on how it is being appropriated in that particular context. Hence, it is important to understand the importance of criticality in the analysis. The third C is collaboration. The biblical text is a collaborative reading between what we referred to at Ujama as the scholars or the trained readers of the Bible uh, in the academia and organic intellectuals who are based in the community. It is through this collaborative process of rereading the social historical context that comes into dialogue with the contemporary context. The fourth C is context. The context shapes the focus of the text in analyzing the lived and embodied realities of the poor and the marginalized communities that we read the Bible with in our context. Context is a reflection on what is going on in the community in terms of the challenges that require a biblical reflection or an analysis. The fifth C is the, about the primary objective of the CPS process, which is to reflect social transformation in the community through a redemptive rereading of sacred texts that are considered toxic or problematic by society. These texts are read with communities, taking into consideration the dominant reading of this text. Sixth is contestation, which is very much relevant to our article uh, and what it presents today. The CPS is overt about the existence of contestation in the text. It, is, it recognizes the different voices, the liberationist or the oppressive nature of the text is the shape of the method. And this biblical uh, text can be also be a contestation uh, of life or death. Um, and our CPS on the crucifixion recognizes the importance of this. Texts like 2 Samuel 13, verse 1 to 22, 1 Kings 21, 1 to 16, are some of the texts that are contested from a hermeneutical perspective. We use these principles to examine different topics. Our most recent work on Matthew, understanding of masculinity has been a CPS on the crucifixion of Jesus and male violence against men. I now invite David to present the second part, the CPS on the crucifixion. Over to you, David. 
Thanks, Stephen B. So, so we wanted to use uh, the passage to explore masculinity further. We'll just put up the passage for you to have a quick look at it. And we want to draw your attention to three things in this passage which we think are important. The first are indicated in the red. They are the explicit references to the stripping of Jesus when he was taken by the soldiers into the Praetorium. You can see one reference at verse 28 and another at verse 31. In addition, there are two other references to other strippings. They're not explicit, but they're referenced, they're implicit. First of all, the stripping at the flogging in verse 26, it's believed that victims of flogging were stripped and flogged naked. And also right at the end, verse 31, when Jesus is led away to be crucified, again at the cross, he was stripped of his clothes. So in just six verses, we have four references to stripping. Uh, to different ex uh, instances of stripping, two very explicit in red, two uh, referenced and implied in blue. But we also have a third detail, and that's they gathered the whole cohort around him. So three significant elements of a passage, and we worked with a, a group at the university in the Ujima Center to fashion a set of questions that would take the group into this passage further. Next slide, please. This is the contextual Bible study that came out of the group process. The first three questions are taking the group into the passage in more detail, allowing them to explore their thoughts about it. And then three crucial questions, four, five, and six. Question four, asking about the number of strippings, drawing the group's attention to there being more than one stripping. Then a question about the significance of the stripping. How is it to be understood and described? Is it a form of violence? And why do the soldiers do it? And then question six returns to this particularly disturbing detail that we're told it is a whole cohort that's assembled, but often readers are not aware that a cohort of soldiers, a whole cohort at least, was about 500 soldiers. So that's an important detail which is in the text but is not always noticed. And that leads to a follow-up question as to what other forms of sexual abuse might have taken place when so many men were involved in the repeated stripping and beating of Jesus. At this point, I'll pass on to Charlene to talk about some of the responses and insights people offer. Um, thank you, colleagues, um, and lovely to, to join you. Um, you will see, like counter the productive method that we're, we're often uh, involved in, what happens here is a deliberate slowing down of the reading process. So we see the process moving from community consciousness, so the interpretive resources of the community, to critical consciousness where we draw on specific text, textual de details and slow down the process even more, again to community consciousness in order to make the link between text, context, and impact. So as David has mentioned, we read this work, um, we, we developed this Bible study with the class, we we understand our work as a, uh, as a collaborative process. And what's really interesting is that uh, colleagues in the class and those who participated could follow the logic of what happened here. They could think, yes, of course, in these circumstances, this is the sort of, of thing that would happen. And that is fairly obvious and, and it's completely understandable. But the moment that connection was made with the body of Christ, it, it is almost as if the connection uh, couldn't be made that far and as if there was a little bit of uh, resistance. And I think this speaks to the pervasiveness of a church or a sacred or a decent theology. And in that way, the body of Christ is understood as, as holy or sanctified or somehow separate from embodied lived realities and, and the things that happens to bodies in our contemporary society. And I think what we um, try to, to illustrate with this work and with also with our methodology 
is something of the indecent, of, of a queer methodology that tries to disrupt, uh, that, that uh, brings discomfort in order to create space to have complex uh, conversations. We've, we've drawn on this insight and this work um, also in other Bible studies that we've developed. So we're reading, especially Genesis 37, the story of uh, Joseph, in the context of LGBTI violence, violence committed against um, queer people in the African context. And there, although we don't have a deliberate question around the stripping of Joseph, we add that detail in and we refer to, to the work that, that we've developed with David when we discuss the stripping of Joseph by his brothers and, and them separating themselves um, from it. What we, what we see with doing this work is that we consider the Bible as the springboard into complex contemporary conversations. No one wants to, to, to talk about male-on-male -male violence. No, no one wants to go to that dimension. And yet here the text grants us an in to have a conversation about what happens here in the text, but also then allows us to have a conversation in our contemporary society. We are currently developing this work for publication, but uh, stay if you go on one more slide, there's also some work uh, that our colleague and friend, Professor Gerald West, um, have developed out of this work. And we're really trying to, to get more colleagues to, to think and to work with us. Uh, James, thank you very much for, for the opportunity that this was, and, and I hand um, back to you. Thank you very much, Jim. And uh, thank you, David, uh, Tembiso, Charlene, and Wusle for your papers. Um, they are from a context uh, which I myself come from in Southern Africa, and I found them enriching. And I know that uh, all of you are well-published uh, scholars. I, I will start with the first paper, and um, I, I have, uh, I'll give my own reflections on what it triggered in me. Some, I may not have questions. Um, first of all, with the methodology itself, um, I think the first C that Tembiso mentioned was community. And immediately in my mind, I thought, um, when I thought community, and we're talking in the context of liberation, I thought usually communities have a hierarchical structure. And I was thinking, how does that affect um, the, the, the contextual Bible study or the contextual Bible reading when it is brought into a community which has members who are in a hierarchical structure. That's something that I was thinking about. Uh, then in terms of criticality, uh, where the, the question is, there's always good or bad when you uh, look at uh, dominant texts, say, for example, the Bible text. And I was thinking to myself, especially when Charlene uh, spoke about how it seems to be difficult uh, sometimes for the participants of the Bible study uh, to think about uh, Jesus in a certain way, compared to if you're talking about, say, Joseph, for example. And I was thinking, is it then necessary to direct how um, the participants of a Bible study uh, think, because sometimes I know from the context of uh, Southern Africa, sometimes there's a tendency to only think the good. If there's any bad, it is deep in people and they may press it down and not reveal it. So that, that's something that I thought about, not necessarily a question. And, and I like the fact that um, you, you, you spoke about the context being the lived and embodied part of, of, of these uh, Bible studies. Um, I had a question actually for Charlene when she spoke about the slowing down between text and context. How do you do that? I, I was just interested in, in how, how do you do that in, in getting there to be a slowdown. And, and uh, again, I'll go back to, you say something about the text being a springboard and I wondered how much direction do you have to give? Again, when I asked this question, I asked it in relation to, to the divide that I seem to be getting between academia 
and the people. And, and this, I think, will be a recurring theme uh, in, in maybe all the presentations, because from, from say, from the spotlight uh, presentation, the Han theology, it's about the masses. And, and there's this divide between scholars and what uh, the masses actually know and feel and experience. So I, I was wondering when we use the text as springboard, is there a need to direct people that, okay, this is where we want to go towards queer theology? Yes, th thank you very much, Jimmy. Um, maybe let me say thank you to you, uh, Shingi, for your very insightful analysis uh, of what we have shared. Um, and thank you very much for being a comrade. <laughs> so let me just start with the question around the community that you raised. Um, it's a very important uh, question, especially uh, when you consider the work being done in the rural areas where the hierarchy does play a very important role in safeguarding some of the work being done uh, by, by people in that context. We work with the leadership of the community um, because we have people who are in the community who work there as activists. So they are able to engage, to organize meetings for contextual Bible study in those contexts of communities. So we are able to navigate the, the hierarchical structures because we have people who live in those communities who are able to navigate. By the time we get there, the community as a whole is organized to be part of a contextual Bible study. Um, and therefore it's a reflection of the community, both at a hierarchical level as well as at a, a level of the margins. So it's a collaborative reading of the Bible by everybody who's part of that community. Uh, we don't impose ourselves on a community, but we work through the structures that already exist there. But also there are churches there. We do contextual Bible studies within the context of the church in those areas. And there we work with bishops, we work with deans and, uh, and priests in those contexts. So contextual Bible study is open to everybody. But what is key is that everybody comes as an equal in the process of rereading this sacred text. And that is unique about the whole process. Thank you very much. All right. Um, uh, Shinya, maybe just to, to connect to Stembiso and to continue our conversation, thank you for your insightful uh, remarks and also for some of the questions in the chat. Um, yeah, it, it, it's brilliant questions because it, it, it asks critical things about the methodology, right? That, um, I think a lot of our engagement with the biblical text is outcome based, right? We read the text, someone reads the text on a Sunday and they preach and they want you to do something. So it's very instrumentalized our engagement with the text. What we try to do at the Ujama Center is to center the text in, in our conversation and to bring interpretive resources from community members. So those who bring embodied interpretive resources and biblical scholars into the mix. So it's a, it's a bit of a collaborative uh, space for collective exploration. And when we say we slow down the process, uh, you will see what, like when we get invited to do a contextual Bible study and someone tells us you've got an hour, then we say, you know what, um, invite us again next time if you've got more time. We literally try to slow down the process to five hours, something like that. And um, you will see from the from the questions that David shared that it's that it's often this thing of oh you answer one thing or you engage one thing now and then we say okay go and reread the text again and now focus on this specific detail and it's not it's not a free for all it's it's got a very clear direction where it's steering you to so it's not a oh let's all just see what we can do it's got an ideological commitment to liberation and it tries to draw on on scholarly insights or interpretive insights that would enable communities to tap into into those complexities. Jonathan has asked in the chat a really important question and maybe something that that we um, that we've been working hard on in our process of development. You know, when we started doing this work and maybe even when we did this work with David a couple of years ago, we were very much like, OK, let's all just jump into this experiment. And then we realize people get really, really triggered by uh, some of the topics that we discuss. So, for instance, we, we read the Bible with LGBTI people who suffered homophobic hate crimes. And then to read a biblical text and ask people to reflect on that, that's, that's, um, 
that's highly complex things and it brings up a lot uh, with people. So what we've started doing is um, insisting on, on psychosocial support. So we've trained a number of our staff members to be available and on hand to insist that, to also create long breaks where people can check out of the process and connect with facilitators and to do, to do follow-ups on that. But this is like maybe in the beginning when we were doing this work, um, this wasn't sort of the stuff that we were thinking about a lot. But now we are realizing the need of support and care and scaffolding uh, the process also with our participants. David, I don't David? know if you want to jump in around the scandalous body of, of Jesus. <laughs> There's some interesting <laughs> questions there. Let me thank you, because I think that's a great question. And, and also for you, Shingi, I, I think one of the really valuable aspects of the approach of the CBS is it always starts with the question, what is the text about? In other words, what do you individually feel the text is about? And that gets the Bible study process off uh, in a really good way, where everyone can offer their thoughts and those be equally valued. In, in terms of the question on the scandal of it, I think that is one of the challenging but productively useful aspects of the Bible study, that it, it does tend to provoke um, resistance or questioning or uneasiness, which is, of course, entirely understandable. But the important part of that is to see that that should be extended to all survivors of sexual assault and, and sexual abuse. So if people um, have a, a, an internalized sense of unease about this happening to Jesus, why in terms of other survivors does it tend to come out as blame and stigmatizing them? Um, why isn't the, the concern that is felt for Jesus typically extended to other survivors as well? There's a different instinct at work. And the, the Bible study often will bring that out into the open and give an opportunity for that to be discussed and people's thinking to be changed as a result of that. Okay, great. I see Charlene is typing an answer. Um, maybe we want to stay with this a little bit and in a couple minutes shift to Boule, but since we have a, th a thread of thought going here, if anyone else wants to kick in. Yes, Jimmy, if I may come, I think there's a question from Alne in the chat where I think the question is about how do we ensure harmony in the Bible uh, when the readers differ in terms of their views. Um, I think for us, we are we are overtly ideological, I think, in our approach to, to contextual Bible study. So we, we take um, the route of engaging the oppressive structures and systems that appear in the text. Um, and we try and deconstruct the dominant reading of the biblical text that is oppressive. So wherever we find elements of the text that are oppressive, we expose those elements and we engage them. If it brings disharmony, we will be okay with that because our intention is not to be neutral, but to be overtly uh, ideological, challenging systems that are oppressive in the biblical narrative. For instance, if you take the rape of Tamar in 2 Samuel chapter 13, 1 to 22, we can't be neutral in our reading of that text. We are overtly ideological. We challenge the patriarchal nature of the text um, that, that is at play um, in creating a, a conducive environment for the rape of a vulnerable woman in that case, who eventually spoke out against her rape um, in that narrative. So we will not be neutral there, even in a context where people differ with us, we will remain overtly ideological. Another example would be the killing of Napot because of his vineyard, uh, where Ahab, used, Ahab and, and Jezebel uses their power to take away Napoth's vineyard would be overtly ideological. We will take the, 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 the side of those who are oppressed, in this case, Napoth. So um, our intention is not to create harmony per se, but our intention is to challenge systems and structures that are oppressive in the biblical narrative so that we affirm the vulnerable in our communities through the redemptive reading of the Bible. That is the intention of the contextual Bible study. 
Um, okay. um, there are also yeah. questions from Nathan and oh, did you, Charlene? Yeah. You wanted to? Yeah, can, Jimmy, I can I can answer. I can engage that question of Nathan. Thank you, Nathan. Great to to see you on this uh, platform. Um, so so what I meant there is that we don't. Um, I mean, we've never read the story of Joseph and this uh, story of the stripping of Jesus together. What we do, however, is we we draw on the work that David has developed um, through through the stripping narratives of Jesus and the implications of that violence when we discuss the story of Joseph, because we it's so interesting when you read that story, you sort of gloss over the violence of that stripping of his coat, throwing him in the pit and then that juxtaposition of the brothers who sit down to have a meal. So in the discussion of that question, we often, re so we say, okay, what, what do you see about this violence? What, what sits behind this violence? So the uh, annihilation of difference, um, what is the mechanisms at play here? So, so the, um, the shaming, the stripping of identity, very similar mechanisms as, as what we see in, in the stripping of Jesus. And we, we use, so we just imp sort of plug in some insights of, Jay, uh, of of David's work into that and and to see the ways in which it enhances the discussion. Um, I think it's 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 probably in the Joseph narrative it's less scandalous. I, it's it's experienced less scandalous because somehow I think you know the church has made of the body of Christ this holy, sanctified, removed, perfect, untouchable entity. That's very far removed from people's lived lived realities. And when you touch me on my body, um, then that conversation around Jesus becomes qu quite hectic. And, um, you know, people, it evokes a lot of emotions, but it's exactly that destabilizing element that I, that I think leans towards um, creating spaces to have a more complex conversation as David also referred to.